Now in professional learning environments, we're looking at the idea of particular adult learners, although many of these concepts can also be applied to um, younger learners, but how we go about preparing others to utilise educational technologies. Essentially how we go about teaching adults and providing a learning environment that supports self-directed learning. Uh, part of your hybrid learning activity should be considering how the learner is going to utilise these, the tool that you're creating, the learning experience that you're creating uh, with your tools. So the idea of a professional learning environment has mostly come about through um, experiences of professional development and uh, training models where we set up an environment that is conducive to professional learning. Now this can be challenging. There are a range of different issues around setting up a professional learning environment. Um, communities of practice is one model that's proven quite popular where we build a learning community of like-minded professionals that are all interested in learning about something together and working through that process. There's also coaching and mentoring where we have particular um, experts that guide the learning of others and utilizing that model. There's a model called the train the trainer um, where the idea is that you would pick a couple of people in an organization, you would teach them how to do something intensively and then they would go and teach their colleagues. So there's also things such these are people that go to conferences and they listen to innovators and they see what they're doing or they might read books written by innovators and they get some good ideas and they bring them back and they introduce them into their organization. Now the innovators don't tend to do much introduction of new, new stuff into an organization. They're too busy sharing their ideas with the world. It's the early adopters that go and look at what the innovators are doing and come back and look at how to actually introduce uh, such innovations into their um, spaces. Then you have the early majority. These are ones that listen to what the early adopters are doing and if the early adopters are able to put in a relatively convincing um, argument, they'll adopt it and see how it goes. They're willing to try it. And that's around about 34% of an organization. That is another 34%, which is the late majority. Now, these are ones that are going to hold off until they see the early majority achieving some successes. Once they see some success being achieved with the new innovation, then they are happy to get on board. But they want to see it proved in their environment before they invest the time and energy into adopting it. And then you've got about 16%, which are called the laggards. Now, these are ones that are not going to get involved unless they're forced to get involved. Um, if everyone else is involved, then they will begrudgingly start looking at getting involved, but normally they have to be coerced or incentivized um, into um, adopting the innovation, and they will never do it happily. Uh, so you have to accept in introducing any new innovation, any new educational technology, that there's going to be a wide range of different um, engagements with what you're presenting. Now, most of, the, most of you in this course would fit within the, sort of the top half of the innovation spectrum. Um, some of you may be innovators. They're quite rare though. Um, but hopefully you would fit within the early adopters or at least within the early majority where you're willing to look at what's happening with the early adopters and take these ideas on board and try them out. So that's the idea of um, innovation and there's in the course material there's some nice graphs and some tables that give you a little more detail about the characteristics of these various types and so you can think about those and think about them too in the context of the hybrid learning activity that you're developing. Not everyone is going to jump in and engage with it in the same way. How much you be able to consider that? in how you develop your hybrid learning activity. 
Now, another, another model that we look at and use a lot is the TPAC model. Now, this came from some early research that identified that the way we teach can often be different depending upon what we're teaching. The content may differ depending upon the approach that we have to teaching or vice versa. So, for example, if you were going to teach, um, let's say, drama, doing a didactic lesson where you stand up in front of a class and they all sit there looking at you and write down notes from, the, from an overhead projector may not be the best way of teaching a concept in drama. There may be other pedagogies, other teaching approaches that would be better suited for teaching, say, a, a concept of um, dramatic movement. Uh, but if you were to teach a maths lesson where you were teaching the concept of fractions, then perhaps a um, impromptu drama performance may not be the best approach for teaching fractions. There may be better pedagogies that are better suited for teaching fractions than um, improvisation. Not to say you probably couldn't teach fractions through improvisation, but it may not be the best approach. So that's the idea that there are certain pedagogies that are more suited to a certain content, and likewise certain content that's more suited to certain pedagogies, approaches to teaching. Now, Mitchell and Collier, in coming up with the TPAC model, also considered the idea of technology. Sometimes there are certain technologies that are more suited for teaching certain content. Let's say if we're teaching fractions. An overhead projector may be very useful in teaching fractions. A voice recorder may be less useful. Uh, more useful might be some pizzas, where you can sort of break them apart and look at the fractions as part of the pizza. But a pizza may not be particularly useful for teaching um, geography. So there are certain technologies that are better suited for teaching certain um, content. Likewise, there are certain um, teaching approaches, pedagogies, that are more supported by various technologies than others. If you were going to again, let's say, teach in a didactic way, um, standing up in front, then having a digital projector is a great technology for doing that. Having a digital projector um, when you are teaching archery may be much less useful. So there are going to be certain technologies that support different approaches and content for teaching. Um, if you're going to do group work, then having a technology that supports student communication and note-taking and managing projects would be very useful. But that may not be particularly useful if they were doing a whole series of numerical calculations in mathematics. So the idea of the TPAC model is to try to match up the technology, the pedagogy, and the content. And where they all align, then the most effective learning should occur. Okay, the final model is the SAMA model. Now this is, works on the idea that there are different types of educational innovations. Some of our educational innovations are simply what we call substitution, where we take what we were doing traditionally and we substitute a new technology for that. So for example, writing on a blackboard can be substituted to writing on a whiteboard to where the whiteboard technology is really just substituting the blackboard technology. Having a digital tablet that you write on and is then projected onto a screen is again a substitution of a whiteboard and a blackboard. There's no real um, improvement to the process. But that doesn't mean it's not a bad thing to have. Sometimes we want to communicate something onto a board or to a group of people and being able to do that by writing something up may be the most effective way of advancing their learning. 
Now, augmentation is where we improve the learning experience um, because of the technology. So having a digital projector is generally more effective than having a um, overhead projector where you've got to write on things on with a pen and project that. A digital projector means we can also project movies and animations and um, we can do slideshows and a whole range of other things. So it's not incredibly different. We could still do those things with um, video projectors and slideshows and other tools, but it's a much better, more efficient and effective way of doing things. It's augmented the learning activity because of that. Then we have what's called modification. This is where we make a significant advance to what's happening because of the technology. So some examples of augmentation might be to have a mobile device where you can take the students um, on an excursion and still be showing them information. So all the students might have a tablet with them and as they move around a museum, they're presented with new information and it might speak to them and give an audio feedback and the students may be able to keep notes and they might be able to collaborate and share those notes with each other even though they're in different parts of the museum. And so this would take what would be traditionally a hand printed um, set of um, excursion instructions that the students sort of fill in a form and I saw a dinosaur in this location that had sharp teeth, etc. Um, having a tablet is a modification on the process where they can do a lot more now. So it goes beyond just augmentation. We can now do things such as coordinate where they are. They can see where each other is potentially if it shows their locations. And we can also update things in real time. So as the students are moving through, the teacher can add new information into the learning experience as things progress. So all of these are quite different to a more traditional approach of a worksheet that they might take on to an excursion. And then finally, we have what's called redefinition. So this is where we do things quite differently. So an example on the same theme would be a virtual reality excursion where students put on headsets and go on an excursion, but in this case, they're going on an excursion to the top of Mount Everest or to the moon. So these are things that just simply wouldn't have been possible without the virtual reality headset. We couldn't even have conceived of doing that sort of thing without the technology. So we've completely transformed the experience through the educational technology. Now, one thing to be clear on is that just because something is transformative doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing to do. Um, there may be times when, yes, putting on a virtual reality headset and um, experiencing walking around on Mars is a fantastic way of learning something. But there may be other times when the students have to create graphs of the temperature on Mars, where doing that on a whiteboard may be the most effective way of um, learning about temperature changes on Mars. There, there's lots of other ways of doing that, but don't just dismiss um, different approaches and different aspects of educational technologies because they are lower on the SAMA ladder. Um, they all have their place and good educators should be able to draw upon a whole range of different educational technologies and use them in different circumstances as the needs of their students arise and the educational experience that you're crafting occurs.